if you just say averaged over all of history, what has been the main way people influence the future? Mm. Clearly, children is the overwhelming way, mm -hmm. right? Just having children, first of all, is the yeah. over overwhelming way that anybody in the past ever influenced the future. Mm -hmm. Now, since humans arrived, we have cultural uh, ways we can affect our children. And so that's been another way we pass on our influence to the future is by imprinting our culture on our children. Uh, but over time, we've developed more ways we can influence the future. For example, as you said, you could accumulate wealth. You might pause to sort of look at your menu of legacies and ask, like, so far, which ones have been the most effective and maybe which new kinds of legacies maybe have more promise to have more effect in the future. But I think you got to admit, overwhelmingly in the past, children has been the main way people have influenced the future. What do you think the odds are that humans will populate space? Uh, well, I mean, we are occupying some space. <laughs> the question is how much more, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, so first of all, we might ask about will we leave Earth mm -hmm. and populate the solar system? And I would give that, you know, pretty high probability, you know, over three quarters or something. Um, then you might ask, will we leave the solar system to populate other things out there? And for that, I'm less sure that I'm more worried about it. I'd like it to be high, but uh, it could end up being low. That is, maybe it's only a 10% chance. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that's not crazy. Mm -hmm. you're, so you're very confident that we'll, we'll be an interplanetary species? Right. I don't see us dying in the next century or mm -hmm. two, and I think that's enough time that we would then start to populate the rest of the solar system. Mm -hmm. And, and with, um, with all the things that are going on in the world right now, um, there, are, there are wars, there's talk of nuclear weapons, um, we're, we're seeing pr potentially a, a, a downward trend in population as uh, people seem to be aging, and we're, we're living longer, so we have more population, but we're not actually having more children. Um, these things, not a factor? I am worried about fertility, but that's, mm -hmm. um, you know, a problem that'll, if it, if it gets severe, it'll be over a couple centuries time scale. Mm -hmm. And then most likely there'll be a rebound, but there could be a painful, costly period in between. Mm -hmm. uh, but still, again, the, the chance we go extinct seems to be really low. Mm -hmm. I also think that even if we suffered a really drastic, like nuclear war or something, there'd still be some humans left around who would within say a thousand years bounce back. So, um, it's actually pretty hard to kill us all off. <laughs> yeah. So if, if we're going to be out in space, uh, beyond earth, um, you've talked about a, a new paper with grabby aliens. Would we fit the definition of, of a grabby alien? What's a grabby alien? So what we mean by a grabby alien is basically a more specific model version of what we'd call a loud alien. Now, a loud alien is just an alien that from a very long distance you would notice they are they are not quiet and so the simplest way for aliens to be loud is that they would expand into the universe and then they would start using things and they would change them from their original configurations into whatever configurations are most useful to them and then looking out in the universe you would see a volume that they had touched and changed and that would just be pretty noticeable <laughs> And that's sort of, I, I think, a default thing to expect about a civilization that allows many different parts of itself to do what they want, uh, doesn't constrain them greatly, and that continues to develop and uh, evolve as we have. So that is, if we just continue, if we don't die, and we just continue to have uh, growth and uh, and improvement in technology and that had many different parts of ourselves which each did different things and competed with each other then I think the default is that eventually we would go out into the universe and use stuff and change it mm -hmm. and eventually that would just be really big and visible and we would therefore be loud so uh, we have this paper on grabby aliens and so that's a more specific mathematical model of loud aliens so the, the specific math I think um, maybe for for the uninitiated, the, the idea is that normally people use the Drake equation to, to sort of figure out um, the probability of aliens, but, but you have a very different model, right? 
it's not necessarily in conflict. It's just mm -hmm. a different way of thinking about the question. Mm -hmm. So uh, the idea is that we're modeling the distribution of alien civilizations in space and time. And so there's this vast universe we're in, and they show up randomly in space. That is, we're thinking of very large time scales where we're looking over many, many galaxies. So on a very large spatial scale, everything's pretty uniform. And so you can, the simple model is they show up randomly in space, and they show up randomly in time, but according to a power law that is a function of time that's raised to a power such that things happen more often later in time than earlier. And this model uh, has three parameters in it. There's um, the two parameters in this time evolution. There's sort of an overall rate, and then there's the power and the power law. And then when something appears, it soon starts to expand and grow at some speed, and that's the third parameter. So it's a simple model with three parameters <laughs> on the largest scales. Things appear at random times according to this two-parameter power law, and then they grow at some speed. And this is a statistical model. It doesn't tell you where exactly they appear. It just tells you the distribution of where they appear. And you can simulate this statistical model to get you know, a description of what the universe might look like over time except, of course, it depends on these three parameters. Uh, but the key claim here is that each of these parameters in this model we can fit from data we have, and that you need to believe in this model overall because otherwise we look crazy early. <laughs> and therefore, this is our rough guess of the model of uh, where aliens are in space-time. And so our claim is we now roughly know. Mm -hmm. Not that we're absolutely certain, but this is more likely than not, roughly where aliens are in space and time. Mm -hmm. And so I can say things like, aliens appear roughly once per million galaxies. So pretty far spread out, but since there's a trillion galaxies in the universe, observable universe, there's maybe a million alien origins. And that they expand at roughly the speed of light, like within a factor of three or four of the speed of light and that we would then meet them in roughly a billion years mm -hmm. if we were to go out and to expand like they are. And that's actually quite an achievement to be able to say those numbers to you, to be yeah. able to say, because people have long wondered, you know, mm -hmm. what about aliens? Could there be them? Where are they? You know, and so I'm telling you, hey, we've got a space-time distribution of the aliens. We, we know roughly where they are in space-time, at least according to the simple model. We can fit the three parameters to data so we can roughly tell you how often they appear and when we'll meet them, how fast they're expanding. We got it. <laughs> the answer. So we, we haven't seen, at least uh, uh, maybe we have in, in UFOs and things, but we're, we're not 100% certain on, on seeing other aliens out there. So maybe let's break down this, this model a little bit. Um, it seems there are first a series of hard steps that life has to evolve through and then so that's where the power law comes mm -hmm. from. So um, on Earth, um, life appeared relatively early, and then we have appeared relatively late. And uh, then some key events happen between then. And this all fits a standard model of how hard things happen within a limited time duration, which is actually also our standard model for cancer in a body like yours or mine. So if we just think about cancer, your body has trillions of cells, uh, many trillions of cells, and each cell uh, must undergo roughly, say, six mutations if, to become cancerous. Um, the chance of each of those mutations is very low, and in any random cell, the chance that any of those mutations will happen is low, but you have so many cells that uh, Event there, by the end of your life, there's actually roughly a 40% chance that one of the cells in your body will have undergone all six mutations by the end. And we have a statistical model that tells us then the distribution in time when those mutations would have had to happen in that cell that got cancer. And we can say that the chance of cancer over time goes as a power law, i.e. by the number of steps. So if there are six cancerous mutations required to get cancer uh, in a cell, then the chance of cancer over time goes as the power of time to the sixth. <laughs> um, and the spacing between the events uh, of these various mutations is roughly equal, even if the different mutations had very different um, 
sort of difficulties in terms of on average how often they'd occur. So the analog for then a planet like Earth is that um, for life on Earth to have arisen and then gone through these difficult steps and then reached where we are now, uh, that was a very hard thing, a very unlikely thing. Very few planets do that, but eventually some do, and we are one of those lucky ones. And because of that, we can say that this simple statistical model applies, and therefore the time duration between these steps is roughly equal, even if the steps had very different difficulties, and that the chance that we would appear across time on, on Earth went as a power law of the number of steps. Mm-hmm. And actually, six steps is a reasonable estimate, although it might be three, it might be 12, but somewhere in that range. And so we can then apply this distribution of when life would appear on a planet with the overall distribution of planets forming and, and how long they last to produce a distribution within the history of the universe of when advanced life like us would appear. And that's also roughly then a power law. Mm-hmm. That is, uh, advanced life like us would appear almost never very early on, but as time went on, the rate at which it might appear increases with this power law. And we are now presumably a typical example of advanced life appearing. So that would be one of our key assumptions, the analysis that we are a typical um, time when advanced life might appear. And um, then we can use that to set one of the three parameters in this three parameter model. But a key point is that this model says that the most likely time for advanced life to appear if a planet would just stay empty and waiting as long as it took for advanced life to appear would be trillions of years in the future. The most likely places where advanced life would appear would be on the longest lived planets and some of those will last many trillions of years. Most of, most planets will actually last many trillions of years. And according to this power law, the most likely time to appear would be near the end of those trillions of years. And so here we are very early on a planet that's only 4 billion years old. And so this is crazy early, (laughs) according to this calculation. Uh, And our explanation is, well, the assumption that the universe would sit and stay empty is wrong. That is, right now out there, there are advanced civilizations popping up in different places and then expanding and within a billion years or two, the universe will be full of these advanced civilizations and there won't be any places left for advanced life like us to appear anymore. And so we had to appear now because this is just before the deadline. And if you appear after the deadline, then it's too late. So to, to see if I, I grasp this, there is a series of steps that life goes through and the probability is, is very low in an individual space, but in total across all of space, there's a high probability that it will advance in many places to a point where we would see complex life like ourselves. Right. And that's on the power law. So to, to visualize that, that's like, um, that's like watching a compounding interest kind of curve. The more time you have, the more rapidly that compounding interest would rise. Well, the compounding interest is actually an exponential curve and a power okay. law is a little different, but still there, there, you know, there, there are things that jump up at the end. Okay. And so the more, the more time that you have, the, the higher the probability of, of reaching a high point in that curve, whether that's evolution right. of complex life or becoming a billionaire. So, you know, our, our listeners can go to our website, grabbyaliens.com and see a, a visual uh, simulation of the scenario. And so early on, everything is empty and then a few places start popping up and growing. And then over time, they just pop up faster and faster mm-hmm. until everything's full. Mm-hmm. Because like, like cancer, there is more time for the change to happen. And so eventually, just as some cell in the body would eventually get cancer on a long enough timeline, some other planet out there, some other star right. is going to have life evolve. And just like in your body, the cancer is more likely to happen near the end of your life than the beginning. Mm-hmm. That's what the power law is saying. And so here the end is the deadline when everything is full. When the universe is full of alien civilizations, then it's too late for a new one to appear. Uh, So most likely you're going to appear just before that deadline. Uh, That's the most likely time when something would appear. And that's where we are near the end before the deadline. Mm -hmm. And there's this issue of the, of the speed of expansion too. If there, 
if exactly. they're coming if they're coming slow we would in theory be able to see them way off and know that there are aliens out there but if if they're moving at the speed of light we'll never see them coming so we we have the simulation and it the speed of expansion you know the structural simulation to look similar except it's just stretched out in space more if they expand faster in space but it's basically the same space-time structure and so if they expand very slowly uh then you would see them from a long way off coming mm -hmm. um and then um eventually they'd get you to you but if they were expanding at exactly the speed of light you wouldn't see them until they got here mm -hmm. and so we can run the simulation on different possible speeds and we can ask how fast would they have to be coming so that we wouldn't see, see one on the sky on average from where we are as a typical origin time. And so we've done that simulation. It says basically they need to be expanding, say, more than a third the speed of light. Otherwise, we'd be pretty sure to see some of them now, and we don't. So one of our key data points, there's, I said there's three parameters and three data points. For the speed parameter, the key data point is we look up in the universe and we do not see enormous volumes of alien civilizations in the sky. And we would see them if the expansion speed were lower. They would volumes would be much bigger than the full moon in the sky. They would be huge. They would be clearly visible, and we don't see them. So therefore, they must be expanding fast. And so mm -hmm. that gives us the second of the three parameters. I told you the first one comes from our current date. We can assume like we are a typical um, civilization in terms of our rank among them. So so you could say. You know, we could be rank 0%, i.e. the very first one. We could be rank 100%, the very last one. We could be rank 50%, i.e. the very middle civilization that appeared. And what we're going to assume is say, well, there's a 10% chance we're in rank 0 to 10, another 10% chance we're in say, rank 10 to 20, 10% chance we're in rank 70 to 80. We're just going to assume a uniform distribution over our rank. And that gives us the distribution over that parameter. Mm -hmm. What do, you, what do you think the, the possibility is that maybe the, the world that we live in is, is a simulation or something like that, and that we're, we're never going to see these aliens, that our, our situation is actually very controlled? And have, have you considered um, things like simulation theory? Uh, of course. Mm -hmm. um, now, so you could throw a number of different theories into a similar bucket where you say, everything we see is under the control of some agent who can make it appear however they want to and mess with us. Mm -hmm. So that could be like the zoo hypothesis. Some people said, well, maybe there's a big artificial screen about the solar system and they're projecting a movie of the universe on the screen. And then really, if you go past the screen, it looks nothing like what we see. Okay. That's in theory, one possible view is that our telescopes are just seeing this movie screen and they're not actually seeing the universe. Right. That's, that's one theory. Another theory, of course, could be that we're in a computer simulation and everything is simulated. Uh, a related thing, there's a god and he can just make us see whatever he wants us to see. Um, all of these classes of theories have the problem that um, it's hard to reason about until you have some idea of the agenda of this supposed power behind it. Um, and it, it just often is just kind of intractable. <laughs> Mm -hmm. to think about these theories unless you make some concrete assumption about what they're doing and why. So, for example, um, we could say, why would aliens put a screen around the universe, our solar system? Well, they want to see us evolve, you know, naturally without interference or something. And then we could try to use a hypothesis like that to draw some conclusions. In the computer simulation, we might say, well, People in the future of our timeline, they will be able to create these simulations of their past, and therefore we are a simulation of their past that they wanted to study their past a little more. Um, so once you make a more concrete assumption like that, you can try to make some progress with those theories, but honestly, they're just really hard to work with. Mm -hmm. So I, I do try to just tend to set them aside and uh, analyze things as if that weren't the, the truth, because that's just really hard to think about. Mm -hmm. And you have you have written the book The Age of M, which is about minds that are essentially simulated. They're human brain emulations. So, is is there credence? But, but that's to, a to that's this? a very real world in the sense mm -hmm. that uh, these are emulated minds, but most of them are not being fooled about where they are. Mm. And there's not that much reason in that world to fool them. That is, a, a small percentage of them are fooled for particular concrete reasons that make sense in that world. 
but um, that the kinds of emulations that would be fooled and the things they would believe in that world aren't what we look we see now mm -hmm. so that's not a very good explanation for what we see because that's not what they would do mm -hmm. uh, but most almost all of the, those M's are fully aware of who they are and where they are and what they're doing and why they, they are not fooled mm -hmm. uh, so it's you know they are artificial but that doesn't mean they're fooled in that sense right so you might say well a car is an artificial horse but that doesn't mean someone driving a horse car thinks it's a horse <laughs> right it, it's it's a car you know it's mm -hmm. a car and you're driving the car for the car purposes and it acts different to horses in many ways so um i think you want to distinguish just something that's artificial from some sort of a illusion or a way in which somebody is fooled by mm -hmm. an illusion mm -hmm. What, what would be a reason to, to keep an emulation in the dark on, on being in a simulation or something like that? Well, for example, you might want to know how they would behave in a crisis. Mm. Uh, would they be loyal, for example, in a crisis, or would they be calm and uh, effective in a crisis? Um, so you could put them in a crisis simulation. And uh, this habit of putting things in a crisis simulation to see how they work, it's like a fire drill. Um, you know, when we have periodic random fire drills, we all get used to the idea it's probably not a real fire. <laughs> so we're mostly pretty calm and, and just go along with the drill and do it. And now, and when there's a real fire, that's probably also what we'll do for at least for a while until we realize it's actually not a drill, it's a real fire. Mm -hmm. And so the emulations would then actually be pretty okay in, uh, you know, the fire drill situation where they don't know if it's not a real drill, but usually it is. So. That's what they do. Hmm. With with this ability to potentially, you know, convert human brains into something that can live in a digital space, would we would we expect to see that in our lifetimes, or are we on some sort of power law situation where uh, eventually we're going to cross a threshold where where we can all expect uh, to preserve our minds like that? So the brain emulation scenario requires a technology that seems feasible eventually, but it's not near in the world today mm. uh, but it still may end up being the first way we are able to make human level artificial intelligence in a machine mm -hmm. as we know our brains are human level intelligences and if we could only transfer what we have in our head to a machine then it would also be a human level artificial intelligence and so you know if we look at trends on the key technologies that would need to be achieved in order to to produce emulations, then we're looking at you know half a century to two centuries sort of time scale. Mm -hmm. uh, you know that's how long you you need to be expecting to wait. So not in the next few decades. What would be the the things that would um, that would push it out that far? I and mean, you know I've, I've read Ray Kurzweil um, you know projects to 2049 and says that we'll have this convergence of uh, genetics, nanotechnology, and robotics, and all that will come together. What um, what suggests 100 years, 200 years? Well, Kurzweil is known for being extra optimistic. <laughs> he's he's made similar forecasts, except with much earlier deadlines that have now passed. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, um, but basically, I'm just trying to project the key technologies needed and look at their past trends and just project those trends forward. Mm -hmm. So, for brain emulations, the three tech key technologies that are needed. One is computers. So just we need a lot computers to be a lot bigger, faster, cheaper. And they're on a trajectory to do that. Another is we need brain scans to be cheaper and faster, but they're also on a trajectory. So you have to take an individual human brain and scan it in fine spatial and chemical detail. And um, the third thing we need is models of how each kind of brain cell takes input signals and turns it into output signals and changes internal state. So we have many decent models for many kind of brain cells, but we need models for all the kinds of brain cells in a brain in order to have that part of it done. So um, again, each of these has a trajectory, a past track record. Some are easier to predict than others, but roughly again, a century or so. Mm -hmm. What role do you think that uh, cryonics will have in all of this for, for people and yourself? Cryonics is a way in which you or I can roll the dice and have a chance to continue on in the future. Um, that is, they will freeze you now in liquid nitrogen, and then later on, uh, they may be able to revive you. And so brain emulations could plausibly be created directly from a frozen brain, 
front of frozen cryonics patient. And therefore, um, in fact, that may be some of the first brain emulations that are done or created from cryonics patients. And that would be a way that you might plausibly show up in this future <laughs> is by becoming a cryonics patient and then being uh, revived as a brain emulation in this future. And so, of course, that means that you might appear in this world and the world might be interested in you, maybe mainly because you're an ancient relic. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, that's at least something. And, w and what got you interested in, uh, in taking on that, uh, that endeavor as well? You mean to be a Cranex patient? Mm -hmm. um, just not wanting to die. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so, so it's, it's a sort of option for when medical science gives up on you and they were going to quit. And so instead of quitting, you say, well, let's take this other option mm -hmm. and let, let freeze you. And then when you're frozen, basically no changes happen. Uh, and you could stay frozen for centuries if only, you know, supporting social systems would maintain you <laughs> and then uh, you could come back. Mm -hmm. how, how do you hope that that's going to play out for you? I mean, it, it seems um, like there's a lot to consider there. Mm, it, does, it seems like a pretty easy choice to me <laughs> that is almost everybody we know tends to spend money on medicine and health under the usual presumption that they'd like to keep living if living would be similar to their current life. Uh, it's only people say in extreme pain or disability, uh, dementia, et cetera, that would typically consider not continuing on. So the, the default is pretty strong. Almost, almost everyone defaults toward wanting to, at least the option to continue. So mm -hmm. that's what I want, the option mm -hmm. to continue. What um, what if uh, maybe it's, it's not what you expect? I don't, I don't know. If you read science fiction like the the Baba verse where this character he comes back and um, he's yeah. he's disconnected from his body and it, it's it's frustrating um, what um, what do you think it'll play out like well so my book the age of M as you mentioned was my attempt to work out in great detail what a world of brain emissions would be like mm -hmm. uh, and you know according to my analysis it's a reasonable world mm -hmm. uh, it's not a world where you're you feel disconnected from a body uh, and, you know, it, it would be a world where you would feel just fine. Uh, you, you would suffer from, like, the world not being the world you expected it to be. You know, many things you had gotten attached to aren't there anymore, for example, and there's new friends to make and new political systems to get used to and, you know, all sorts of changes. But um, we, we actually have a lot of data in the past on people who were willing to make substantial changes to their lives in order to you know find something better in part of their life right so people in a world you know in a place where say there's a flood or an earthquake or a war and if they stayed they might well die then people have been willing to leave and go somewhere else even though the new somewhere else was often quite different and of course people are willing to just live for many decades right so by now i'm an older person and the world is very different than the world i grew up in and I might regret that in some ways, but I'd still rather be alive than, uh, you know, not, I'm not going to complain so much that everything is not the way you know, people and leave it all alone the way I, I liked it originally or something. Mm -hmm. So, so you're you're very precise, and maybe the the metaphor breaks down, but it, something more like um, a migration rather than a, a, a rupture is how we could look at at something like um, like Cryonix. Well, I mean, when somebody say, in your, you know, two centuries ago, left Europe to go to America or mm -hmm. to Brazil or some other place in the world, it was a pretty rupturous event. <laughs> uh, within a short time, their life changed a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, their environment changed. Um, their associates changed. You know, their careers changed. People have been willing to make pretty large changes. Mm -hmm. uh, First to avoid dying and then also to, to find a better life. Mm -hmm. And what, what about the, the physical, tangible elements of this? Um, what, what would overcome that for a, for a person who's, who's in this state? Um, a brain emulation is the technology that implements a creature like you or me. But from their point of view, they have a body and it feels like your body feels for you. Uh, it's in a virtual reality, but to them that 
reality is as real as your reality is to you right now. Almost everyone listening is probably in a room somewhere. Mm -hmm. You just have to realize your room is a virtual reality in many ways. That is, um, you have created an artificial world that isn't the natural world out there, you know, a few hundred miles away from you at least. And uh, you've made this world look the way you want it to, and you've hidden many functional details that you know are there, but you just don't want to look at. So behind your walls, there are pipes and there are wires. Uh, there are structural supports. You know that that's all in the wall, but you don't want to th look at it and think about it, so you don't. It's that You aren't fooled. You're just in a world that is the way you want it to be. Mm -hmm. So similarly for brain emulations, they're gonna be in a world that is the way they want it to be. They will have more degrees of freedom than you do, but they will be able to f have a body and feel the body. Now, they can change the body more often than you can change yours. They, mm -hmm. they could always make it young and beautiful and healthy. Um, they can make their environment luxurious. They can decorate everything with diamonds and gold if they want, uh, because that's cheap in virtual reality. But it still looks real to them. Mm -hmm. And it is real to them, just like your room is real to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and what of the uh, the the response to emotion and things? And we have we have a brain, but we also have an endocrine system and and things like that. That you know, if a person feels angry, then they also get a rise of adrenaline. Right. Um, so what, what so your brain if... is enormously complicated. Mm -hmm. And in fact, your endocrine system is much simpler than your brain. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. In the process of emulating a brain, they would also just emulate whatever other systems they need to go with the brain, hmm. and then they would emulate them to whatever resolution is necessary for the brain to be comfortable with it. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean it would be exactly the same. It would just be good enough. Uh, so just like your body at the moment is in an, an artificial environment, you're wearing artificial clothes, and you have artificial you know, haircuts, um, and you aren't therefore having exactly the same experiences as an ancestor of yours from a million years ago would. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's not as many bugs crawling in your hair, <laughs> right? Um, but you're, it still feels real to you and appropriate. Mm -hmm. And so the emulations would be different from us, but only, you know, to the degree they could tolerate and were okay with, and perhaps even liked, right? So mm -hmm. they would just have a, again, different bodies and then different endocrine systems. And different uh, whatever else it took but you know they would so just like the way we have made our world is often a trade-off between not wanting to change too much but then wanting some things to be different right mm -hmm. uh, and so the way we physically look say we the way we cut our hair or the way we clip our toenails etc uh, we make our physically environment around our body different than it would have been but um, also comfortable and familiar right mm -hmm. So uh, emulations would do the same thing. They would, you know, to the extent something seemed weird and and distracting because it was uncomfortable or, or just awkward or strange, they would then make it more familiar. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to the extent that they was something familiar wasn't so great and they wanted it to be different and they tried it different and then that felt okay and then that could become the new normal and that's what they do. Mm -hmm. So if the if the higher complexity is the brain and if we can emulate the brain, then emulating other systems of the body is is well within reach and and we could expect a very believable experience well a, a very compelling experience right mm, so okay. it, again it's not a, it doesn't have to attempt to be an, an exact emulation of how we would experience things right mm -hmm. so just we don't make our world so that it exactly emulates what our an distant ancestors would have felt <laughs> we we make a compromise based on not wanting anything to be too weird, but also wanting them to be better. And again, that's what the emulations would do. They would now have a space of possibilities where they could, you know, the endocrine system, for example, they could make it exactly like one of ours. And so, you know, they got tired just as we did and their body, their muscles got sore just when we did and they got sleepy just when we did. They could make it exactly the same probably, or they could mess with it. Maybe they don't want to sleep as often, or maybe they don't want as much pain, right? Whatever it is, they want it to be different. They would search in that space and, make some things different. Mm -hmm. So your, your previous book, which I have here, The Elephant in the Brain, um, talk about things in the way of our nature as humans. Would there be a chance that we would uh, work some of those out in these emulations? What, what things might we want to take away? What might be the bugs in human nature? So the key idea is that 
some things are easier to change than others. Mm -hmm. um, so the brain is this enormously complicated structure and complicated structures with lots of interdependencies are just harder to change. So, you know, initially, uh, brain emulations would keep all the same structures that people didn't understand and didn't know how to mess with usefully, and so they would just leave it alone. So this is what we say often do with old software. Uh, we might have an old piece of software and nobody wants to be bothered to figure out how it works and to change it, so they just leave that part alone, but they can add other things onto it that maybe modify how you would use it in some context or something, right? So the human features that are sort of embedded in this complicated structure in our head, those will be hard to change at first. And then other things are easier to change. So at the moment, when we want to change people, which we do, we change via sort of incentives and training and culture, mm -hmm. education, um, and we change them in the ways that they're easy to change, the ways they're designed to be changed. And so, um, and that gets a lot of change, right? We are able to make different people work in different careers. We're able to put people in different physical environments. We're able to induce them to do a wide range of different jobs, all using these pretty simple tools uh, for changing people. So, what, so what's, an, what's an example of that? A salary or um, right. tax breaks or? So first of all, just school, right? Education and training. Mm -hmm. We, we take people and we make them into a dentist or we make them into a firefighter or we make them into a soldier uh, by putting them in a certain training regime with other people and, mm -hmm. and then giving some rewards and tests and selection. And that produces these different kind of professionals. Mm -hmm. And then culture more generally like produces a civilized person, say, or a person who's inclined to obey standard laws or the customs of their culture. That's something we do by just exposing people to a culture and training and, uh, you know, socialization where they're rewarded for being like the people you're supposed to be like and shamed if we're doing different and that all works okay. Mm -hmm. And in addition, of course, we also change people with more direct incentives. We, we offer them salaries and bonuses and commissions. <laughs> and, uh, and we say if you form a business and it makes a lot of money, you can keep the money and do what you want with it. And that induces people to go try to figure out how to make profitable businesses, right? So those are all ways that we take the humans that are born in our world and we change them. And so emulations will have all those mechanisms available to themselves, to them, and but they can maybe also do more. So they could do more by going inside emulation brains and playing with them. But, but initially they won't understand that well enough to do that, do much of it usefully, but over time they would learn to do more. Uh, but it seems like we're already plenty plastic enough as creatures that it's already possible to make us into sort of a very wide range of different creatures appropriate to different circumstances. So it doesn't seem like we are actually very limited in that way. I mean, we're, we're already pretty pliable and plastic. Emulations would just be more so, but it's not clear that additional plasticity is that valuable because we're already pretty plastic. Mm -hmm. So in, in The Elephant in the Brain, you've written that something along the lines of that uh, people and competition can be people's greatest problems. Um, what what could we tweak or could we tweak anything to make us more um, collaborative rather than competitive, especially with a big ambition like going to space? I think we already are pretty collaborative. Mm -hmm. And competition is one of the ways that we collaborate. Mm. Uh, that is, we, we use competition to induce collaboration. Mm. That is, competition is one of our mechanisms by which we induce people to do stuff that's useful for us. Uh, they, you know, we say, if you win this competition, then you'll get the stuff you want, and that will be good for us. And so we get you to work for us by offering you competitions. Mm -hmm. So competition is a way we cooperate. Um, now, you know, we might think sometimes people have a, a mental state, for example, where they have a hostile intent, and we would rather they didn't or something. So... With emulation, sort of mind reading would just be more of a thing. Uh, we can already read minds indirectly in the sense of reading people's facial expressions or you know tone of voice or, or how, whether they sweat. And we actually can read each other pretty well. Mm -hmm. But emulations could read at least the surface of their minds in, in even more depth. So uh, they could hide even less of what they are thinking, feeling. Mm -hmm. But again, I'm not sure 
that's really an issue in the sense that people are already pretty cooperative. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you're they're already you're, pretty transparent. <laughs> right. Yeah, your, your last uh, your last sentence in Elephant in the Brain is something along the lines of we collaborated our way all to the moon. It, you know, it's it's incredible. Right. Let's hope that was a, a real thing. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, absolutely. Um, back to life on Earth, though. Um, what what are the, the things that you see as big threats? You work for uh, Oxford and you study the future of humanity. What what could be the threats to human life on Earth? So um, we have been growing for a while mm -hmm. as a species, and um, we grew more slowly, say, during the farming era, I'd say doubling every thousand years, and, and during the industrial era, we've been growing every 15 years. Um, and if that growth continues, then we have a very bright future. Uh, you might be worried about where we will go with that growth. So some people's concerns might be that we will sort of betray our true values and our original, you know, place of being in a good people in a good state of mind. And we will become some terrible, rich, <laughs> powerful, but terrible creature or something like that. So that's one sort of fear people might have. Uh, about the future and obviously another fear is just extinction mm. uh, you might think something could go wrong to just kill us all off it's actually pretty hard, hard to do but it's certainly well worth looking for those things and trying to prevent them um, and then um, you know what else could go wrong mm -hmm. uh, so we could you know grow slower than we otherwise might so you could think of that as a problem we could um, not allow ourselves to grow in some categories of things, say, say we might freeze in certain aspects of society or the economy and not allow those to improve and only allow some other things to improve. Um, we could, of course, have many sort of temporary setbacks. We could have wars or pandemics, etc. cetera. Mm. Um, but I actually think um, when I think about aliens, this theory of aliens we were discussing, um, aliens fall into sort of two basic types uh, at the first level. There is quiet and loud. Mm -hmm. So the loud aliens are the ones that are very visible and obvious, and they've expanded in the universe, and quiet are the ones who didn't. <laughs> that is, quiet aliens would have stayed, say, within their solar system. They might have died or they might have just limited their expansion. And there could actually be more quiet than loud alien civilizations out there. <laughs> Um, when I've done polls, people seem to think so. And that means that's a big choice about our future. Will we be quiet or loud? Mm. And that's a very monumental choice. So, uh, and it's not an easy choice. And so making that choice wrong, I would have to count as one of the biggest issues we will face. Mm -hmm. when, when you say making this choice, it seems at a glance that the question is, can we do it, not will we do it? Um, well, that, what's, the choice, what's the at the moment, we, don't ha we can't do it, right? But again, our technology and our economy is doubling roughly every 15 years. Mm -hmm. And the universe is like 14 billion years old. So you're looking at a factor of a billion there in timescale differences. <laughs> so mm -hmm. as long as we keep growing anything like the speed we have, then within say a million or 10 million years, we almost surely would be able at that point to expand. Mm -hmm. So when I'm looking on the cosmological timescales, I say, um, you know, within a million years, we'll either kill ourselves or we will expand or we will somehow choose not to expand. Mm -hmm. And I'm quite confident that within a million years, we would have the technology to do to expand if we wanted. Mm -hmm. But if we, if we choose not to expand, then eventually something wipes us out, the, the sun goes supernova, and, and that's the end of the human race. Well, we could probably survive those things more intentionally, but if there are in fact already these gravity alien civilizations out there expanding, then within, say, two billion years, they'll show up. Mm. And then they would take over, right? And okay. they would decide what happened to us. Uh, we, we could have become one of those gravity alien civilizations, and then in a billion years or something, we would meet them out there somewhere. And uh, then we would decide what happens at our border. But if we 
stay quiet, then we will just stay here until they show up. Hmm. And um, you, you mentioned a, a lot of things and in, in a, a need for expansion in the world. Um, I didn't hear you mention global warming, climate change. Um, is an expansion of the human population uh, in, in conflict with our climate? We are, again, doubling our technology every 15 years, doubling our overall productive capacity every 15 years. If that continues, then we will have enormous capacity to deal with all sorts of things. So mm. global warming is just a small expense relative to that level of capacity. Mm -hmm. and more fundamentally, though, if an age of M shows up, that is, if brain emulations appear in the world and become the dominant life form on Earth, they are just much less vulnerable to global warming or other sorts of ecological disruptions. Mm -hmm. uh, they are just basically not biological anymore. And if you know they accidentally kill off nature, they still keep going. So one of the main reasons you and I are concerned about killing off nature is that we are pretty aware that if we kill nature, we die. <laughs> and we don't want to die. So as, as much as we like nature and want to help it for its sake, we also really don't want to die ourselves. But brain emulations would not have that issue. So they could brain emulations just wouldn't suffer from global warming much at all, personally. Uh, they might worry that the biosphere would suffer from global warming, but they might not care that much about the biosphere. So. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about continuing to expand, uh, what role do you see emulations having in that or, or artificial intelligence and, and things like that? Is is that maybe the, the offset for uh, the decreasing fertility that we're seeing? If, again, brain, if brain emulations appear, they will appear relatively suddenly. That is, there's not really a way in which you can have half an emulation. You either have an emulation that works or you don't. And once you have one that's cheap, then you would just start making them like crazy and they would just fill up the economy quickly and then they would become the dominant thing in the economy. And so then the population of emulations would just grow very rapidly and the population, the economy would grow very rapidly. And so plausibly it would double every month or even faster. Mm -hmm. So you would have this very rapid growth in the economy and technology all of a sudden. And this new growth just would not care much about biology. Uh, mm -hmm. And so it would just be the next thing. And uh, humans might still exist, but they would be on the margins. They would not be running things. Um, and they might hope to be preserved, but uh, they're not in charge. <laughs> so if, if we're not in charge, uh, what, what are we going to do? Or, or what, uh, what checks can we put in place to, to make sure that we stay in charge? Well, think of the comparison of the Industrial Revolution, right? Mm -hmm. Before the Industrial Revolution, almost everybody was farmers or subsistence farmers or people who, you know, got their food from farmers. And right, that was that world, the farming world. And then at some point, industry was possible. And if you were a farmer out in uh, some rural area, you might say to yourself, oh, if, if industry comes, then the, the growth that will happen will be in industry and industry will displace farming. And if you thought of yourself as intrinsically a farmer, you might say, well, boo-hoo, how are we going to stop? that industry from displacing us farmers. But mostly people thought, well, my, me or my children, we could switch. We could go into industry mm. and that might be good, right? And they would more try to position their children to do well in industry than try to prevent industry in order to save farming, right? Uh, that is when something new displaces something old, if you see yourself as intrinsically the old thing, then you, you just are thinking about fighting and preventing the new thing. If you think that you could become the new thing, then you might be eager for this new thing as, as your route to, to success and, and progress, right? So similarly, if brain emulations are coming, if you say, I am a human, there, I am not an emulation, that's them, I'm us, how are we going to stop them from displacing us? Well, then you're in the mode of thinking you are intrinsically a human and must prevent this new thing. But I would invite you to ask, well, you could become an emulation. Your children could become emulations, right? You could join this new world. Hmm. And at that point, you might be excited by the possibility of this faster growth and all the new things you could do in this new world. It's not them, it's you. Hmm. So what, what does that look like then? That's making, that's someone making copies, making emulations of themselves 
to go out and do this work and do the things that are going to rapidly increase uh, growth in the economy and, and these sort of things. So you've probably heard of the Star Trek transporter hypothetical, right? So there's this TV show, Star Trek, and in the show, in order to go places, people get into one thing and then they come out the other end. But what you're told later on is, well, you were still on the first end. We just made a copy of you that came out the other end. <laughs> and now we have to, you might worry, well, is that other thing that came out me or not? Mm -hmm. And am I okay with going into this thing if the thing that comes out is this other me, not me? And um, if you take, say, an introductory philosophy class and you describe them the Star Trek transporter and then you ask them the question, you're about to get into the transporter. Is the thing that is about to come out, is that you? It's about 50-50. Hmm. People aren't so sure, right? They're, and they're maybe a little anxious getting into this thing, though, because um, it's not going to be me, right? Hmm. But if you ask them a different version of the same question. You I say, you just got out of the transporter. Was the thing that went into the transporter you? <laughs> it's 100%. <laughs> of course. Okay, so what I can confidently predict is that all these brain, brain emulations, they will see themselves as a continuation of the previous human tradition and history. They will see mm -hmm. themselves as human, and they will think it wasn't a big deal. Mm. You looking forward might not be so sure, but you know what? That's what your ancestors might have thought if they looked ahead at your life, right? If mm -hmm. a farmer from 500 years ago had been told about how you would be different from them, how your lives would have changed and all the ways your world would have changed, they might not have been so sure. They approved. <laughs> I mean, look at what we're doing right now. <laughs> we're exactly. having this conversation across the continent. Right now, I don't think that's actually one of the things that would have bothered them so much, but mm. I can identify some other things that might have bothered them. Like a lot what? More about well, we, we no longer respect our ancestors and mm. our religion mm. uh, and the things that we have been bequeathed uh, by our ancestors as much as others do. Mm. And as much as they did, they might think we have betrayed many of their fundamental values. Mm -hmm. In some sense, we have. Mm -hmm. What, what can we do to carry on our values then, especially as, as the world, it seems to be changing so fast. Um, what, what do we do to preserve that? Well, of course, every generation in the past has wondered about this. Mm -hmm. It's been a constant concern through human history. And of course, one of the things we have done is to try to shape our children mm -hmm. to share our values and pass them on, right? We, we raise them in our families, we educate them in schools, we have some initial career paths that we try to use to shape who they are to make them like us. Mm -hmm. And we succeed to some extent, just not to 100%, mm -hmm. right? And that difference accumulates over time. And so far, almost everyone has had to accept that you, you, you have a substantial influence, but eventually you'll be gone and they'll get to decide what they become and you may not approve. Mm -hmm. And some people around today think mm, that's not good enough. <laughs> I need a way to make sure that I can make sure exactly what they'll become. And um, there are some potential ways to do that. I'm not sure they'd be a good idea, but, uh, you know, we could explore that if you like. Well, how, how does that compare, I wonder, to, um, you know, things like sort of building a monument to yourself or building institutions, uh, having wealth and influencing the world through, um, through things that you do with, with your wealth as you pass it on? How does that compare to children? Well, if you just say averaged overall of history, what has been the main way people influence the future? Mm. Clearly, children is the overwhelming way, mm -hmm. right? Just having children, first of all, is the yeah. overwhelming way that anybody in the past ever influenced the future. Mm -hmm. Now, since humans arrived, we have cultural uh, ways we can affect our children. And so that's been another way we pass on our influence to the future is by imprinting our culture on our children. Uh, but over time, we've developed more ways we can influence the future. For example, as you said, you could accumulate wealth, you can build things, you can discover things, uh, invent things. Uh, those are all ways to influence the future. Mm -hmm. You could try to sort of influence what standards are adopted, say a computer language that people use in the future. You can sort of set the standards in it, right? So we've got a lot of different ways we can influence the future. I would call those legacies. Mm -hmm. And so, you might pause to sort of look at your menu of legacies and ask like so far, which ones have been the most effective and maybe which new kinds of legacies maybe have more promise to have more effect in the future. But I think you got to admit 
overwhelmingly in the past, children has been the main way people have influenced the future. Mm -hmm, for sure. Uh, if we are looking at, at philanthropy, though, you're, you're an economist. Um, what, what could we look for to make sure that, that something is actually effective? It seems there's a lot of question about whether or not um, charity and, and things like that are even effective. Well, um, making anything effective is work. Mm -hmm. So um, I've given a lot of thought in general to how we can buy things we want mm -hmm. in a world where we might hand out the money but not necessarily get what we wanted back. So this is a problem more generally in our whole society. Uh, if you want to buy a meal or buy medical care or buy legal protection or buy a building and you know, all sorts of things you might want to buy, how can you buy such things in order to get what you want uh, as opposed to not getting what you want? So that's much more general than charity, I think, and mm -hmm. it is actually a fundamental economic question that I've given a lot of thought to. Mm -hmm. um, and so my, my general attitude is that uh, the more that you can sort of identify the thing you want as a thing you can observe, then what you can try to do is tie financial incentives to the people who provide you the thing you wanted with whether they gave you the thing you see that you got what you want. Mm -hmm. Right. So, uh, so for example, um, in medicine, uh, I would say most of us think that what we want out of medicine is not to die, mm -hmm. not to become disabled, and not to be in pain. Mm -hmm. Those are the main things we want out of medicine. And it turns out those are all actually observable. Uh, but the way we usually buy medicine is we hand some money to people who like have a degree on the wall or something, and we hope <laughs> yeah. that they give us good medicine, right? Mm -hmm. I would say that's just not a very good method. Uh, the degree on the wall is not much of an insurance and neither is their smile or their white coat. Um, so what you really want is a mechanism by which they get paid more when good stuff happens and they lose money when bad stuff happens. And mm. so I could, I could outline if you want, like there are particular ways we could do that for buying medicine. And similarly, you might think if you hire a lawyer, what you want is a contingency fee where like if you win the case, they win money. If they, you don't win the case, they don't win money. Right. Mm. And they were creating incentives. So. I might say, well, if we're thinking about charity for the future, I might be drawn to asking, well, what what are the outcomes that you want in the future? Mm -hmm. And are they outcomes that could be visible, observable, and then could we tie some incentives to the observable outcomes of what you wanted? But first you'll have to ask, what is it you wanted? Well, let, let's talk about medicine because I find this one surprising in, in how we look at it, in reading your work, and I've even... Uh, I've spoken with someone recently who um, who has family in China, and they were talking about how in China it's customary to bribe a surgeon before a surgery. And at first, to, to an American, that seems shocking. But then when you talk about incentives and motivating people financially and things like that, it starts to make more sense. And so I wonder how do you see it? would make a lot more it? sense to bribe them after the surgery. Mm -hmm. You might die during the surgery, right? You might mm -hmm. want them not have you not die during the surgery because then they could get their bribe, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so, so how does how does this how does this work in medicine? So, at the moment, we have many things like medicine where they matter a lot to us, and we want good outcomes. But our strategy for getting good outcomes is usually just to affiliate with somebody who's prestigious and high status. Mm -hmm and hope for the best, mm -hmm. thinking that prestigious people will give us better outcomes than unprestigious people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's probably true as a rough correlation that prestigious people might give you better outcomes, but it's not a very reliable approach. Um, because say you give money to the most prestigious doctors and then they'll just do whatever they do and you might live or you might die, but as long as they are make sure to be prestigious, they may not care that much whether you live or die because um, it doesn't affect their prestige, right? Mm. So they might need to may graduate from the right school or have the right new medical equipment or be up on the latest uh, procedures or go to the right conferences or smooth with the right people and that get, makes them prestigious and then you pay the money on the basis of their prestige and then you live or you die. And that's how it kind of goes. And that ha that's how it goes in many other things we buy. We actually quite often buy stuff on the basis of prestige. We just hire whoever's most prestigious and we pay them whatever money they ask and we hope for the best. And I would say 
we should be able to do better than that. Mm -hmm. For sure. Well, Robin, before I ask my last question, where should people look for you online? Uh, well, I'm on Twitter at Robin Hansen. I have a blog, Overcoming Bias. I have a website, hansen.gmu.edu. And if you Google my name, you can you know find me elsewhere. Uh, I have a book, two books, The Age of M, Work, Love, and Life, When Robots Rule the Earth, and The Elephant in the Brain, Hidden Motives in Everyday Life. And I'm working on more. Great. Well, I will put links to all of that and to our previous interview from uh, when we first talked about The Elephant in the Brain in the description. And Robin, my final question is, when we look at the scope of this conversation, when we look at the scope of your work, um, you have covered so many topics. And I wonder, what suggestions do you have for people when choosing what projects to put their energy into? Um, well, let's see. <laughs> a lot depends on whether you're a buyer or a seller here. Hmm. So. If you're a seller, i.e. you need other people to buy what you're selling, then you need to pay a lot of attention to what they're willing to buy. Mm -hmm. And especially like early in your career, you might need to follow the lead of others in terms of what they're selling and sell something similar and learn to sort of imitate what they do to produce what they produce so that you can get someone to buy. Um, later on, you might have enough autonomy to be a buyer, i.e. Mm. to be able to decide for yourself what you think is interesting and what you're going to do. And then I hope you actually have some interest. Um, a surprisingly large fraction of people, all they really wanted was say the prestige and respect of being in such a position and they didn't actually have anything they really wanted to do. Uh, in which case, then I guess it doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> but uh, so there's, there's often a trade off between specializing and generalizing. I mean, perhaps that's what you're referring to by pointing out my range of things mm. I've done. Um, and, uh, you know, it's tough in the sense that we, our human minds are sort of naturally more general. That is in conversation. We just like to range over a wide range of topics, et cetera. And the modern world economy wants us to specialize. Uh, but we, of course, face a big risk if we specialize in the wrong thing, uh, it might not be well suited to us. We might not find it interesting, et cetera. And so we need some degree of search early on, trying different things to figure out where we might specialize. And then we can also perhaps choose a level of specialization. So there's at least a niche for some people who are less specialized than others. And you might be well suited for that more generalized niche. Um, but you should ask, you know, are you well suited? And um, is it, do you like it? Um, so I am more generalized than most intellectuals who are successful intellectuals, but honestly, most want to be intellectuals. Their main failure mode is not specializing enough. Mm. Uh, so initially when they train to try to become an intellectual, they are, they stay more general than their advisors are pushing them to be. And then they don't successfully specialize enough and that's why they fail. Mm. So, um, <laughs> That's a warning, right? Just, just going with your de the, the degree of generality that feels good to you probably is too much generality. Mm -hmm. But it's also true that if you just pick something at random to specialize and stick with that the rest of your life, that's probably too much specialization. You want to spend some time searching and trying different things before you figure out where to settle. And I think you also have to ask whether how much you care about whether what you do matters. Mm -hmm. Because if you just want to be a successful intellectual of various sorts, then you know when you finally pick a specialization that seems congenial, then you can just you'll find out later it really wasn't that important. Because few things are. Mm. There's just a lot of inequality in what's important. The things that are the most important are actually kind of hard to figure out, and they're kind of rare, and it takes a while to see what they are. Mm. So if you want to do the most important stuff, that means you're going to have to be willing to search longer and switch more mm. until you find them, and then you're going to suffer a personal risk of failing because of that. Um, and that's, uh, you know, something to be careful about. Mm -hmm. But I think if you, you know, the actual work out there is so uneven in terms of how much it matters, that there's just a huge payoff from continuing to search for the most valuable stuff mm -hmm. that makes the biggest difference. And so, um, you know, if you if you have the resources to do that, again, you're enough of a buyer to be able to search a little longer and look at different things. And I suggest that you do that. Well, Robin, 
thank you for having the courage to to do that search in your own work and with all the options you have to to spend your valuable time with me. Uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much.